attempt chapter 11, but let me just warn you, there is a very small baby less than two feet away from this lecture. So you might hear some grunts or some coos or some padding or some tapping. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Your nervous system is one of your coordinating systems, as you well know, along with your endocrine system. However, it can override your endocrine efforts. Therefore, it's the master. It's the master. And the cells of the nervous system communicate with each other and, and with effectors um, via electrical signals or electrical impulses neural impulses, nerve impulses, you've probably heard all of those phrases, they all mean the same thing, and chemical signals, and those chemical signals are neurotransmitters. As we've already established, the nervous system is um, able to elicit very, very quick responses, very specific responses, um, especially where uh, we're, we're talking about an effector whose cells are more individually innervated. Uh, for instance, skeletal muscle is more um, individually, or rather its cells are more individually innervated, um, the whole idea of a motor unit. So it, um, it can be contracted a little bit or, or a lot. Oh, he's snoring. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Um, the next few slides are blank because I actually like to do part of this lecture on the board. So this is my board. All right, let's see what kind of font we're working with here. All right, we've got two major factions of our nervous system, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system the CNS and the PNS. And you'll probably hear me say PNS so quickly during some of the lectures that it will sound like I'm not saying PNS. Mm -hmm. Well, we already know that the central nervous system is the command center, the integrating center, the planning center, okay? But in order to make those plans, the central nervous system needs information, and that information is traveling from, from sensory receptors through the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. Now nope, go back to sleep. That's enough wiggling. Just go right on back to sleep. Nighty night, baby. I don't even have enough hands to pause my lecture. <laughs> and we know that this pathway is called the sensory pathway. Actually, yeah, we could do that. Um, or the afferent. I'll just use a different color. Pathway. Okay. Central nervous system interprets that information, comes up with a plan, edits the plan, sends the polished plan out. Again, through the peripheral nervous system. But this time we're headed to effectors. So we already know that this pathway could be called the motor pathway or the efferent pathway. Who are the players 
in the central nervous system. The organs, if you will. The spinal cord. The cerebrum. The cerebellum and the brainstem. You might think of these as the organs of the central nervous system. Okay. Well, we've got lots of players in the peripheral nervous system. And hopefully it makes sense. That, that sensory information had to come along a sensory pathway. So sure enough, we have sensory, sensory nerves or sensory pathways along the peripheral nervous system or belonging to the peripheral nervous system. And we have motor nerves or sometimes motor pathways within a nerve belonging to the peripheral nervous system. In other words, there's a sensory division, a sensory aspect to the peripheral nervous system and a motor aspect to the peripheral nervous system, okay? So we're making a bit of a dichotomous key. And yes, this information travels like so. This information travels like so, all right? Well, we have different effectors and also different layers of, I guess it's not all that layered, different willability to the different effectors. Therefore, we can further divide that motor aspect into a somatic division or somatic nervous system or somatic pathway. Those are all appropriate. They all mean the same thing. and an autonomic pathway. Okay, these are both motor divisions, motor pathways, so their information, it's still outward bound. In other words, this is output. This is input. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. Good job going to sleep. All right. Well, why do we have these divisions, somatic and autonomic? Why not just motor? because somatic and autonomic have different effectors. Different effectors. Um, let's use red. The effectors of the somatic nervous system are skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscles, I guess I should say. Okay. Therefore, you might think of the somatic nervous system as will-a-bull. It has a will-a-bull aspect or feature to it. Will-a-bull, okay? However, the effectors of the autonomic nervous system are, you probably already guessed this, Cardiac muscle. Smooth muscle.
muscle and glands. These are the non-willable effectors. So you might think of autonomic, automatic. Auto means self, works by itself as non-willable, the non-willable nervous pathway. Okay. Well, <laughs> yay, the autonomic nervous system is further divided into sympathetic. sympathetic divisions, systems, pathways, they all mean the same thing. Okay. In either case, the effectors are glands, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. Okay. Why therefore have this split? Because they have almost, almost nearly opposite effects okay when i think of i'm gonna have a great color for this um we'll go back to this color of the sympathetic nervous system i think of excite exercise Um, I'm rather bubbly, so some people say I'm extra, <laughs> okay, or um, emote, when I think of sympathy, sympathy is an emotion, hopefully a, a, a deep emotion, extra, okay, whereas parasympathetic, parasympathetic, at least historically, has been associated with the phrase rest and digest, um, for that matter, sympathetic has been associated with flight or fight, fight or flight, either, either one's been. Um, I don't use these phrases because they don't help me remember. There's no tie in, there's no mnemonic to help me remember which is the rest and digest and which is the flight, flight or fight. Um, so I actually use a mnemonic that I didn't make. Uh, one of my students made this and it's just always stuck. It was that good. When you get home, first thing, first thing, you just close the door behind you. What's the first thing you do? You probably kick off your shoes, okay? And maybe you even have some shoes on hand that you use for relaxing. What kind of shoe does a person use to relax? Yeah, you might slip on some slippers. You might put on your para slippers. Okay. And personally, that's, that's the mnemonic that, that I use. And that, that totally works for me personally. Okay. Now let's talk about how these guys might have opposite effects, opposite effects. Um, for instance, the muscles that control the diameter of your pupils are innervated by both parasympathetic and sympathetic pathways. All right. But your sympathetic pathway tells your pupils to dilate.
be a smooth muscle, of course. And your parasympathetic pathway tells your pupils to narrow, to constrict. Same target, the same effector, nearly opposite effects, nearly opposite results, nearly opposite responses. Okay. Uh, let's do another one. I'm trying to think of something obvious and I keep thinking of these really obscure ones. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. Ah. Both sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems innervate your heart. Okay. When the sympathetic nervous system is sending neural impulses more so, the heart will respond, for instance, more for one thing, by pumping faster. When getting more neural impulses, Instead, from the parasympathetic pathway, the heart rate slows to homeostatic norm. Okay. Are there more examples? Oh my God, yes. Are they in a different chapter? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> in fact, they're not even on exam three. Speaking of exam three, you may have noticed that there are only, and boy, I use that word carefully, two <laughs> chapters on exam three, whereas exams one and two featured three chapters each. That's because 11, chapter 11 and chapter 12 are beastly. They're just, they're beastly. Chapter 11 is both volume and concept. Chapter 12, some of it's conceptual, but a lot of it's just, I mean, it's just, the volume is just insane. It's insane. I, I literally call chapter 12 the beast. Um, so it is coming. It is coming. Okay. Just to remind us, these are still motor pathways. This is still output. Okay. This little map of the nervous system needs to become permanently tattooed in your brain, which is ironic. Use your brain to memorize your brain and his friends. Because we will use it for the rest of the quarter but you will also need it again and again and again. It's almost as bad as the tissues in 242, okay? All right, what else did I wanna show you here? Mm. Some other aspects, I'll go back to that green, some other parts, if you will, um, of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. In both, well, actually, let me give you a little bit of a preview. I'm gonna use this next, this next slide. And I've, I've drawn this before, probably equally as, as horribly.
okay, way, 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 way oversimplified neuron. One of the chief cells of the nervous system. and terminals. Okay, drawing a, a neuron, even uh, an oversimplified neuron like this every time I want to talk about neurons would be a nightmare. And other people have realized this too. Therefore, often the shorthand for a neuron this. Okay, well, I'll, I'll translate that in just a second. All right, this part is called the cell body or the soma. In fact, that's the nucleus. Cytoplasm certainly here, um, but it's also along the axon filling um, the branches that lead to axon terminals. So all the internal space has cytoplasm in it and it has organelles in it, but most of the organelles are in the soma. Okay, and then again, these guys are called axon terminals. Well, it turns out that in our nervous system, when we have or where, I should say, we have um, multiple neurons, cell bodies together. We clump them together. And we clump multiple axons together. Okay. In the peripheral nervous system, a clump of axons, a clump of axons, It's called a ganglion. There are many ganglia, plural, in the peripheral nervous system. And a clump of axons in the peripheral nervous system is called a nerve. There are many nerves. Some are strictly sensory nerves. Some are strictly motor nerves. Many are mixed. They house both pathways going to and fro. We're getting close to Halloween, but that just looks nightmarish. It's a little bit better, all right. In the central nervous system, a clump of cell bodies has a horrible name. It's called a nucleus. There are many, many nuclei in the central nervous system. In this case, a nucleus is a clump of many cells. Whereas, if we're talking about the organelle of a nucleus, most cells have one nucleus inside. Same word, but English is stupid. And a clump of axons in the central nervous system is called a tract. 
there are many, many tracks in the central nervous system. So just to reiterate, a clump of cell bodies or soma, depending on where it is, it could be called a nucleus, unfortunately, or it could be called a ganglion. A clump of axons or a bundle of axons, if you like that better, depending on where it is. It could be called a tract or it could be called a nerve. Okay. Now, this particular map that I made on slide two, three, three, sorry, um, the board work, in other words, all right. I personally can um, generate this concept map from memory correctly every time without studying. And I've been able to for years. And I can go quarters without teaching 241 or 242 and I still have this down. That's because I have a couple of mnemonics that help me. I have not this highlighter has to be just so. <laughs> Must be saturated with yellow. I have, I have no explanation. <laughs> okay. Um, here's what I remember. Never split an S. Look at the boxes that start with S. Sensory, oh, it's never divided. Somatic, oh, it's not divided. And sympathetic, oh, it's not subdivided. Never split an S. The other thing I remember is to always spell map. If I never split an S and I always spell map, I can, I can regenerate, duplicate this concept graphic correctly every time. And now you can too. All right, let's move forward. We might come back to this. I don't think, actually, let's actually, let's take care of one more thing while we're here. So, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Typically, typically, at least on the same effector, it's not like they're, they're um, equally influential on the same effector at the same time. It's, it's more like one is in charge or the other is in charge, okay? Whereas autonomic and somatic systems are not they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. I can use both of them simultaneously. And here's the example that I like to use. You'll recognize it as mine because it involves zombies. Okay, so you're walking along at a good clip with your best, most beloved friend. You're on the sidewalk. And while you're walking, you're just looking in front of yourself to, to make sure that you don't trip and that you know what's coming and that you see that dog and that you see the root sticking out of the sidewalk and, and you know, there's a crack in the sidewalk and, you know, just to keep aware of your surroundings, all right? And you really are rarely looking at your friend even though you're talking a mile a minute, because you know your friend is there from their responses, right? While you're talking a mile a minute, they're saying, uh-huh, oh my God, oh, seriously? Oh my God, I did not even know that, <laughs> right? They're, they're, they're responding to you, they're a good listener, and that's one of the reasons why you, why you uh, are so close to this person, all right? So. You're walking along at a good clip. You're talking a mile a minute about this crazy class that you're taking. 
and you suddenly realize that it's been a few minutes since your friend has said, uh huh. Oh gosh. Oh, really? Ooh, that's evil. Okay. And so you finally decide to turn your head and look at your friend. And oh my gosh, your friend in the last few minutes has become zombified. There's suddenly a zombie, your most beloved friend. All right. Well, both your somatic and autonomic nervous systems are going to respond. They're both going to kick it into gear. Okay. Your somatic nervous system will help you elicit motor plans to either run, <laughs> run away, or find the nearest weapon, an ax or a baseball bat or something, and put your dear friend out of misery. You're going to have to will those skeletal muscles, right? You're going to have to will yourself to take action, or you're going to become a zombie too, oh. or zombie food. In the meantime, your autonomic nervous system is kicking it into gear. It's telling your sweat glands oh. to be especially active. It's telling your cardiac muscle to kick it up. Greater contractile force, greater heart rate, greater blood pressure, blood volume, all of that. And it's telling your smooth muscle, hey, it's not really all that important to digest right now. It's more important that we be able to escape and survive. So smooth muscle, you're not so important right now. Take a rest. Okay? So this is an example, an extreme example, but an example of many where you're using both. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Whereas your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems, they, they at least to some degree exclude each other. Either one is more so in charge or the other is more so in charge. Okay? Now... Finally, <laughs> let's move on to, what is this literally? One, two, three, four, slide five, okay? And let's look, let's look um, carefully. Do we already know that the nervous system has sensory receptors? Actually, it's actually, I said actually twice, uh, on the slide already. An integration or command center that perceives the meaning of that sensory input, applies a meaning to that sensory input, and also comes up with a motor plan? Yeah. And then do we know that that motor plan has to be sent out to effectors? Yeah, we, we did this ages ago. That's old review. In fact, if you look at the next slide, slide six, we drew something like this the first week of the quarter, okay? But here is that, that shorthand put into action where this dot means soma, this straight line means axon, and this fork means leading to axon terminals. Terminal branches leading to axon terminals. Okay? We're going to see that shorthand again and again, so it's kind of nice to know what it means up front. If we go to the next slide, hey, do we already know that we have a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. Yes. Do we already know that the central nervous system is comprised of the brain, meaning cerebrum, cerebellum, brainstem, and spinal cord? Yes. Do we already know that the central nervous system is that command center responsible for perception and planning? Yes. Do we already know 
that the peripheral nervous system is everything else, both the input and the output. Oh, we have a wiggler. Oh, no. We'll go back to sleep. Make seepings. Good job. Good job making seepings. Yeah, we sure do. But we're now finding out, and I'm going to back up and add to our, our hot mass on slide three. There are two different kinds of nerves. Cranial nerves. It means they originate from or feed into your cranium, like more directly. Okay, maybe don't poke yourself in the eye because that's a good way to wake yourself up. Sleeping is good. I like sleeping. And spinal nerves. And we'll learn way too many of those uh, later. Anywho, go to sleep. Go to sleep, little one. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. On that slide that we just came from. Shh, 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 shh. Oh, we're pooping. Do we have to do that on... on Yes, we do. Okay. Well, I can't tell if we're officially going back to sleep or not. Anywho, my point with this slide was we did that already. That's old news. All right, look at the next slide. Do we already know? Yes. Do we already know? Yes. Old news. All right. Next slide, eight. Hey, do we already know that the main, most immediate divisions of the peripheral nervous system are the sensory and motor pathways? Yeah. Do we already associate afferent with sensory and efferent with motor? Hopefully. Hopefully we started doing that early on. We started. This will come back later. Not so much right now. Um, but we will run into somatic versus visceral. We already know that viscera means internal organs. So if we have some sensory pathways coming from and going to, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say going to, uh, coming from um, our internal organs, our deep organs, then the pathways that those will take will be visceral sensory pathways and the pathways that would be coming from um, all other regions like our skin, our joints, like slightly more superficial stuff, skeletal muscle. Those would be moving along somatic sensory pathways. And we want to specify somatic sensory because we also have somatic motor. Isn't that evil? Anyway, that won't really haunt us in this chapter. Uh, it'll just haunt us later. Yay. <laughs> it will haunt us. I promise. Okay, motor. We're on our way to effector organs. We already know that. The effectors of the human body. How many are there? Four. How do we know that? Our instructor won't shut up about it. Yay. All right, so glands, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, skeletal muscle. Can you keep this baking in your mouth so that that would be helpful for me? Could you just keep that there? No, I'm too cozy. I'm too cozy being cuddled. Can't possibly do that. Too cozy. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> Do we already know that the motor division is further divided into somatic and autonomic? Yeah, we did that. Let's look at our next slide. Do we already know that the somatic nervous system innervates the skeletal muscles and is therefore willable? Yep. Do we already know that the autonomic nervous system will innervate all other effectors? Glands, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle? Yep. And is therefore non-willable? Do we already know that the autonomic nervous system or pathway is further subdivided into sympathetic and parasympathetic? Yes, we did this already on purpose. Now let's look at the next slide. Look at that. That looks familiar, doesn't it? 
we were just a little more careful to put our S's on one side, uh, like to the side, toward the side, uh, and really draw out our map, right? But it's it's the same idea. It's the same. It's the same flow chart, really. Okay. Now we can start talking about the cells of the nervous system. There are two major cell types in the nervous system. Neuroglia, also known as glial cells, same thing, and neurons. Unfortunately, neurons are sometimes called nerve cells, even though they may not be associated with actual nerves. So personally, I, I don't call them nerve cells. I think that's really misleading. Nervous tissue looks a heck of a lot like, well, to me, it looks like nebulas. Um, or, yeah, nebulous. I think that's a, it looks like space to me, personally. Um, the only thing I, I could uh, mistake it for, possibly, is loose areolar connective tissue. But loose areolar connective tissue will have strap-like collagen in place, and nervous tissue obviously won't. Oh, my baby sounds good grief. What just happened? That was a baby sound explosion. Eyes wide open. You just woke yourself up with wiggles. What a silly goose. First, let's talk about neuroglia. And in the central nervous system, there are four types of neuroglia. Astrocytes, microglia or microglial cells, same thing, ependymal cells, and oligodendrocytes. I know, that sounds like I'm kidding. I made it up. I would, I would make that up. Uh, but sorry, I didn't. <laughs> well, of these four types, I would argue that astrocytes are the busiest. They have so many functions. They cover so many bases. And they're called astrocytes because their cell bodies kind of look like um, starbursts. Astro means star. Okay. Astrocytes are the most abundant of the neuroglia in the central nervous system. They're very branched. That's what gives them that kind of starburst quality. Okay. And they are um, typically very closely situated to um, neurons because they do so much for and with neurons. Astrocytes help to structurally support neurons. Um, like um, like a brace on a bridge or a truss on a bridge, okay? Hold them in place. They help to ensure that neurons receive nutrients from adjacent blood vessels as well as um, you could argue some um, cell signals via adjacent blood vessels. Certainly drugs, some drugs of course. In developing bodies, like the snorry grunty one I'm holding, um, astrocytes help to construct new neurons and they, they do that in a weird way um, I don't know if you were privy to the the construction of the or the reconstruction of the, or the I guess I should say the most recent <laughs> reconstruction of the 520 um, bridge it's it's 2020 now and the 520 bridge in, in Washington is um, it's it's a really long um, kind of freeway that, that allows us to, to traverse a rather large body of water. Anyway, <laughs> just in case you're not in Washington. Um, the, the 520, when it was being built, 
or, or rebuild, I should say. Um, they would build a little bit and then crawl out onto that little bit and build a little bit more and then crawl out onto that, that little bit and then build a little bit more. So um, it was, it was kind of like they were working along the bridge as they were making it. Very, very interesting. And it, it, it looks like it's gonna be a mathematical uh, catastrophe, but it all works out in the end. Because, well, math. Anyway, um, that that's what it looks like when an astrocyte is is constructing a new neuron, a brand new neuron, in a brand new person. Astrocytes also help to regulate the content of the fluid surrounding neurons, which is especially important where ions are concerned because ions have a huge influence on the functioning of neurons. If ions in the fluid, extracellular fluid, outside neurons are um, in excess or deficient in comparison to their norm, uh, that could really impact uh, the function of neurons in a deleterious way. Let's see what else. Astrocytes uh, are responsive to um, neurotransmitters and even directly to neural impulses. So in other words, there is, there is a degree of communication between astrocytes and neurons. And lastly, uh, they're thought to participate at least somewhat um, in information processing. So kind of like a, a cross, um, a functional cross between neurons and, and other glial cells. And in the next slide, which is 15, here's the cell body, at least. Like we can't see the whole thing, but nearly, of an astrocyte. And sure enough, yeah, it looks like, it looks like a, um, an exploding star, a starburst, right? Notice that it's got these extensions, these feet, you see those? That really maximize service area to contact adjacent blood vessels, but also to contact adjacent neurons. Okay. No wonder they're great at facilitating exchanges between the circulatory system and and neurons, baby sounds. Next, microglion, which would be singular for microglia. Microglia are fairly small, um, oval shaped, but they have what looks like spikes or, or thorns projecting from them. Um, so they, they kind of look like something that would be really painful to step on. And they are um, the specialized immune cells of the central nervous system. Most of the central nervous system is protected from um, much of the contents of blood, especially um, larger components of blood, like actual cells, by what's called the blood-brain barrier. And we'll talk about the blood-brain barrier in another chapter soon. That barrier ensures that bad guys, at least the vast majority of bad guys, can't successfully um, traverse from bloodstream to central nervous system, okay? But as a result, our own cells also can't successfully traverse from bloodstream to central nervous system. And that includes white blood cells, the, the many different kinds of um, immune or defense cells that we have. Therefore, um, the 
uh, police force <laughs> that protects the rest of the body is not also protecting the central nervous system. So the central nervous system has its own private security squad, and that, that is the microglia. If we go to the next slide, you can see how spiky, how spiky a microglion might, might be. Another neuroglial cell of the central nervous system, ependymal cells. And ependymal cells um, are typically, um, but not always, but typically ciliated apically. And they secrete, create cerebrospinal fluid, cerebrospinal fluid. Those cilia then sweep that cerebrospinal fluid so that it's continuously moving. It's also continuously being produced. We will come back to that in the very next chapter. Inside the brain are cavities. We'll see that in the next chapter. Those cavities are lined with epidymal cells and therefore filled with cerebrospinal fluid that is moving. If we look at slide 19, we can see some um, likely ependymal cells, ciliated apically, okay? Not only do they move cerebrospinal fluid, they actually make it as well. And I think last on our list of um, central nervous system glial cells are the oligodendrocytes. And oligodendrocytes are, are um, they're really interesting because yeah, they have this cell body and, and projections like, excuse me, astrocytes like microglia, but their projections, and I'm gonna slaughter this. I wanna do a horrible job at this. Instead of being kind of finger-like projections, they actually flare out oops, into almost blankets. And then these blankets wrap around, wrap around adjacent axons, the axons of um, neighboring, here's a cell body, uh, neighboring neurons, okay? And these blankets, if you will, have oodles and oodles of myelin, not to be confused with myosin, myelin. Lots and lots of myelin. Okay, and that myelin acts as an insulator, almost like um, plastic or rubber might act as an insulator when um, enveloping a, a wire, a metal wire. Okay, if we look at the next slide, which is 21, <coughs> pardon me. You can see one cell body of an oligodendrocyte with its nucleus within, okay? And then presumably three blanket-like projections. <clears throat> Extending from that one cell body. Could an oligodendrocyte have more than three projections? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But you can imagine that if the illustrator had included more of these blanket-like extensions, uh, the, the image would get, get overly crowded. And hopefully you can appreciate that this blanket, right, it's wrapped around and around and around this neighboring axon, like a jelly roll, okay? We'll come back to that idea of putting myelin around axons later. 
in the peripheral nervous system, there are just two major types of neuroglia, the satellite cells and the Schwann cells. And, and maybe it's good news they both start with S. Uh, satellite cells are, are most similar uh, to astrocytes in that, in that they have a lot of the same functions. They um, typically will be found surrounding the cell bodies of neurons rather than axons. Schwann cells are um, important, but, but not as varied functionally as satellite cells are. They do a couple of things. Um, they can um, participate in regeneration. It is possible to um, repair damaged peripheral neurons. It is not possible, and I'll tell you later why, to repair damaged central nervous system neurons. Once those are gone, they are gone. You cannot repair place them, pardon me, but those in the peripheral nervous system, if they're damaged um, in a certain way, as long as a cell body isn't damaged, uh, then they can be repaired, and it's Schwann cells that, that perform that repair, okay? But uh, hopefully we're not damaged, and therefore the chief job of Schwann cells is myelination, um, applying myelin to axons in order to uh, insulate signals, just, just like that, that plastic or that rubber um, insulates the metal wire that's carrying electricity to and fro. And we'll look at that visually too, so don't worry about that. I want you to go to slide 23, where we can see, it looks like five-ish satellite cells, at least um, in this cutaway, uh, surrounding the, the cell body of a neuron and it looks like 12-ish uh, Schwann cells, okay? Now be careful. Even though there are 12-ish Schwann cells shown, uh, that number is not absolute, obviously, but also um, there's only one myelin sheath shown. So here's how I think of it. Bead, 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 bead. There are about 12 beads, but how many necklaces are there? Just one necklace, okay? So all of this light blue collectively is called a myelin sheath, a myelin sheath, okay? Notice that Schwann cells, unlike oligodendrocytes, they don't have those blanket-like projections, okay? And, and we'll talk about that contrast explicitly in lecture. I think, well, soon, just not immediately. All right, now let's start talking uh, a little bit more about neurons. Neurons are um, responsible for the, the many functions of the nervous system, whereas microglia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, um, epidymal cells, satellite cells, Schwann cells, they're really the life support. They, they take care of neurons because neurons are so busy doing their job that they, they don't have enough time, if you will, to take care of themselves. You know, I need some glial cells right about now. <laughs> that sounds really good. <laughs> um, anywho, neurons... Uh, can be quite large. It, it, is, it is possible for an axon, for instance, to be a meter long. That's extremely long for one cell, okay? It's still just one cell, but wow, is that long. And especially those neurons that are in the central nervous system, they have to last your entire lifetime because they're not replaceable, all right? Neurons typically are not going to make um, copies. They're not going to be duplicated. Okay, in other words, they don't undergo mitosis, all right? They're big spenders, but we, we've been establishing that all quarter long. They all, or each, I should say, have a cell body called a soma, we already know that, and at least one process off of that soma. Okay, let's look at the next slide. Sure enough, cell body is also known as a soma. Plural would be somae. All right, most neurons, 
most neurons have, well, yeah, actually that is safe to say. Most neurons off of their cell body. So uh, let this be cell body. That's cell body. Okay. Off of their cell body, they'll have many projections that branch and branch and branch. Making these really fine. Fiber-like extensions, okay? These really fine projections are called dendrites. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. Well, in most cases, there are exceptions, but in most cases, the cellular receptors, not the sensory receptors, the cellular receptors that are matchy-matchy for neurotransmitters are either on the cell body, on dendrites, or both. Okay, whereas this part here, that projection, that's much longer. It only branches distally, okay? That's the axon. That's the axon. This particular neuron, can you tell where it is or could you tell before I made a hot mess out of it? <laughs> yeah, you probably saw that the illustrator included These guys, what are these guys? Yeah, they're myelinating this axon, but are they oligodendrocytes or swan cells? Well, oligodendrocytes, because they have those blanket-like projections, it's possible for one oligodendrocyte to do all of the myelination, to perform all the myelination for a single neuron, whereas um, in the peripheral nervous system, it takes several Schwann cells to um, comprise the myelin sheath of a single axon. And those, my, those, those Schwann cells are dedicated, dedicated to that particular neuron. They're not like shared between neurons, okay? Well, these little blue things that I've drawn uh, or redrawn <laughs> are, are those Schwann cells. Okay, we already established that when uh, so many are clustered or clumped together in the central nervous system, they're called nuclei, but when they're clumped together in the peripheral nervous system, they're called ganglia. And the singular for nuclei is, of course, nucleus. The singular for ganglia is ganglion. Okay, let's look at the next slide. Again, the processes that a neuron may feature include dendrites and an axon, okay? When these axons in particular are bundled together in the central nervous system, we call those tracks. And when they're bundled together in the peripheral nervous system, we call those nerves, nerves, okay? Let's look at the next slide. Dendrites. This particular neuron that we're looking at, by the way, is a motor neuron, probably. Probably. Um, based on its shape, and you'll learn more about that very soon, um, and the fact that it's, it's uh, myelinated by Schwann cells. Okay. Um, it is, it's very possible for a motor neuron to feature hundreds of dendrites. Okay. So um, this illustration might even be a little 
a little bit of an underestimate in terms of how highly branched those projections can be. Um, inside the, the lumen, if you will, of a dendrite, we, we expect to find cytoplasm, we expect to find small organelles, but not large organelles. The large organelles are, are really gonna be um, uh, barred from entering any, any especially narrow projections. So therefore they're gonna be housed in the, in the soma itself, okay? Again, dendrites and the cell body tend to be um, receptive. They, they tend to feature those uh, neurotransmitter receptors. Right now, it's not going to make any sense, but I just want to start washing you with the words. When um, a neurotransmitter binds to one of those receptors on a dendrite or on a cell body, okay, what happens is um, charges move and therefore establish an impulse, okay? But the impulse established at a dendrite or a cell body is called a graded potential, a graded potential. Whereas the impulse that travels along an axon is called an action potential. And I'm not writing that on the slide on purpose because we'll come back to it much later. Well, soon enough action potential, okay? Graded potentials and action potentials are both impulses, but they're very different. They have a lot of differences, okay? Where does a graded potential get uh, transformed into an action potential, or where does it initiate an action potential? Here. So do you see how um, this neuron almost looks like it has a neck like if I told you to strangle this neuron, you'd probably inherently aim for where I just put that, that arrow. Kind of looks like a neck. Well, that region is called the axon hillock. And that's where greater potential gets translated into action potential, but we'll come back to it. All right, next slide is really important because it, it zooms us way in, okay? I've never asked my students about nucleolus, but nucleus certainly you should get large organs, organelles rather you should understand are in the are in the cell body. Cell body is also known as soma. Okay, this particular neuron, which happens to be a motor neuron, does have oodles and oodles of dendrites. And both dendrites and cell body are likely to be receptive regions or act as receptive regions, okay? Here, that neck, if you will, is the axon hillock. I'm also never gonna ask you to point out the rough endoplasmic reticulum or mitochondria and just know there are organelles in there because this is just like any other eukaryotic cell. It's got what you would expect. And then here, um, really color-coded in yellow. Actually, let's do a matching match yellow. So you, you probably can't even tell that I'm drawing. I'm just working my way along this, this long projection. That long projection is axon. When that branches, it gives rise to terminal branches, terminal branches, okay? And terminal branches terminate at axon terminals. And you can't tell in this particular picture because we're not zoomed in enough, but those, those axon terminals kind of look like 
buttons or feet. They kind of spread out and, and offer lots of surface area. Okay. Is this a peripheral nervous system neuron or a central nervous system neuron? Well, it's a motor neuron, so automatically it must be peripheral. Sensory and motor are words that belong to the peripheral nervous system, not to the central nervous system. I'm trying to plug in my charger without turning off my iPad mid-lecture. Super fun. <laughs> and also, uh, the illustrator has labeled for us Schwann cells. Right? Schwann cells. Schwann cells. How many myelin sheaths are shown? Very good. Just one. Just one. These many Schwann cells constitute one myelin sheath. Okay. And there's a little tiny gap, a little bit um, overemphasized here, in between adjacent Schwann cells. You could call it a myelin sheath gap, or most people are still calling it a node of Ranvier node of Ranvier. And those are going to be important, just not right this second. Right now we're just learning the anatomy, not quite ready to learn the physiology. Soon enough, though. Okay. Let's look at the next slide. Here's what reality actually looks like. Oh my god. <laughs> right? Figuring out which of these projections is the axon, you'd have to be able to see the whole cell, and I can't see the whole cell. So that's why we go with this stylized illustration. All right, uh, slide 30. All right, we already know that an axon is likely to have an axon hillock, kind of like a neck, right? Some neurons will not really have a, a marked axon, like the axon won't look any different than, say, a dendrite. Therefore, there won't be any distinct axon hillock. Um, there may not even be myelination, okay? But others are extremely long, extremely long. It's possible for an axon to be a meter in length. That's, that's amazing. Some authors will refer to especially long axons as nerve fibers. I will not. I think that's a little bit confusing. So I, I tend not to use that, that phrase um, unless it's, unless we're at a place where I know it's no longer going to confuse you, okay? Axons at their distal end, they branch and branch and branch and branch, terminal branches, right? And despite the illustration, a single neuron could have thousands, thousands of terminal branches. And at the end of each terminal branch or at the terminus of each of those branches is an axon terminal. I've also seen axon button or baton, okay? And at least most neurons, they secrete neurotransmitters from or across the plasma membrane at these axon terminals, okay? So if this end here of the neuron is receptive, oops, then you can infer this end here, the opposite end of the same neuron, this is secretory. What is it secreting? Neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are just cell signals. That's all they are. And the only reason why, they, why, why they're called neurotransmitters and not hormones or neurotransmitters and not um, cytokines or neurotransmitters and not any other kind of chemical signal is because they're traveling from one neuron to another across a really, really short space or from one neuron to an effector across a really, really short space. We'll come back to that. All right, now let's talk a little bit more about myelin, okay? Myelin is... Um, 
a protein lipid blend, okay? Uh, the the lipid aspect is really what gives it it gives it the the insulating property. And if an axon is insulated with uh, myelin, then that both uh, protects and hastens, quickens, if you like that better, the impulse that's traveling traveling along that axon. Okay, so insulate and hasten. All right, some axons are myelinated, and the uh, trend is that the the longer the axon, uh, for that matter, the wider the axon, the more likely it is to be myelinated, okay? Whereas, you can probably infer the shorter the axon, the less likely that it's myelinated. Okay, and that will probably make more sense later. All right, who provides myelination in the peripheral nervous system? I'm on slide 32. Schwann cells. Schwann cells. And Schwann cells wrap around neurons over and over and over again. You can probably see. I'm going to see if I can. Oh, we probably need a teeny or tinier font here. Can you kind of make out those lines? This is actually one Schwann cell. Wrapped around a neuron. Here's the lumen of that neuron's axon. Okay, over and over and over and over again. Well, what's in the Schwann cell that makes it look like there are layers and layers and layers and layers? Myelin. So this is actually layers and layers and layers of myelin wrapped around, wrapped around, wrapped around. Okay, insulating and hastening the signal that travels through really the plasma membrane of the axon. Okay, all together, multiple Schwann cells comprise one myelin sheath, one myelin sheath, okay? And the gaps in between adjacent Schwann cells are called nodes of Ranvier. If you go to the next slide, 33, I think, here's a Schwann cell wrapping around, wrapping around, wrapping around, wrapping around, wrapping around. As if it were treating the axon as an axis, an axon, okay? The bulk of the cytoplasm of that Schwann cell ends up on the outside of that jelly roll. In fact, the larger organelles like the nucleus ends up on the outer edge of that jelly roll. Okay, if this Schwann cell has to wrap many times around, the, the whole cell has to wrap many times around an axon, how many other axons can it serve? Zero, zero. Okay, one myelin sheath, many Schwann cells. I'm on slide 34. Whereas slide 35. In the central nervous system, myelination is provided via oligodendrocytes, okay? Does the entire olig oligodendrocyte commit to just one neuron? No, and in fact, its cell body doesn't wrap around any neurons. It's just those blanket-like projections that wrap around adjacent neurons. One oligodendrocyte could perform all of the myelination necessary for a neuron or possibly even several neurons. It's possible, okay? Uh, I think that's all I wanted to say there, but we're gonna look at an image, I think. Yeah, it's the same image though. In the next slide, before I leave this slide, 
Let's talk about the difference between white matter and gray matter. White matter is pale in color simply because the bulk of what we're looking at is myelinated. Gray matter is less pale simply because the bulk of what we're looking at is not myelinated, okay? Well, what part of a neuron is most likely to be myelinated? Yeah, axons. So when you see white matter, you can assume that you're looking at axons. When you see gray matter, well, what part of a neuron is not going to be myelinated ever, ever, ever? Yeah, that receptive region, right? Think of cell bodies. Okay, in the next slide, 36, same image of that oligodendrocyte where we can see, oh yeah, cell body is set aside, it is not involved in the wrapping process, and it's possible that we're serving multiple adjacent neighboring neurons. All right, next slide, 37, we're going to classify neurons, okay, we're going to classify neurons in a couple of different ways, but consistently over and over and over again. We're going to use all of these classification schemes pretty um, predictably, okay? A neuron may be multipolar, bipolar, or unipolar. If a neuron is multipolar, then it has at least three processes. All of the motor neurons that we've seen thus far in the lecture have been multipolar because they have an axon and oodles of dendrites. Multipolar neurons are the most common. So if we put all of the neurons in your body into a hat and we ask somebody to pull one out of the hat haphazardly, they would probably, most likely, draw a multipolar neuron because that would make up the bulk of what's in the hat, okay? Bipolar neurons only have two processes. One axon, and this is kind of weird looking. I don't know why that happened. One dendrite, okay? They're much more rare or much less common, okay? In fact, we're going to find them only in your olfactory mucosa. That's the, um, the very roof of your nasal cavity where your olfactory neurons are embedded. Those olfactory neurons are bipolar, okay? And in your retina, so your foot, well, some <laughs> of your photoreceptors um, or some of the, the neurons that are involved in photo perception are bipolar Excuse me. Okay. These, of course, are also sensory. We'll, we'll state that again. A unipolar neuron has only one immediate process. There's only one process coming off of a unipolar cell body. And we actually have seen that. Let me see if I can figure out where we were when we saw that. Slide 23, when we first saw satellite cells and Schwann cells, that's a unipolar neuron, only has one projection. Okay, back to where we were. All right, um, if you go to slide 38, you'll see the beginning of a huge table huge and beginning as in it takes up more than one slide, okay, that really helps to lay out the different types of neurons, excuse me, sorry, okay, this column represents multipolar neurons, and here's our classic multipolar illustration, okay, uh, where did I I know I put this somewhere. This actually on the next slide, I'll write it in there later. Okay, and 
uh, how many projections off of this SOMA? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine that we can see, but probably some have been cut away. Is nine greater than two? <laughs> yes. Okay, multipolar. Whereas, here's our cell body in this bipolar example. How many projections immediately off that cell body? Just two. Okay. Here's the the one and only projection off this cell body. Immediately off that cell body. That, therefore, this is unipolar. So this this column is unipolar. This column is bipolar. Okay. And gosh, I think we'll come back to this. It feels like we're going to come back to that. I can't remember, so I'm, I'm gonna do it now, and then it, if it ends up being review, that's fine. Okay, we we know that cellular receptors, um, those that are matchy-matchy fits for neurotransmitters, at least in the multipolar neuron, they're gonna be located on the soma and or dendrites. And so there's our receptive region. Whereas in a bipolar neuron, look at this, all of this, is receptive region. And in a unipolar neuron, only one end is receptive region, okay? What's pretty uniform from one neuron to the next is that the opposite end will be secretory region. secretory region okay and then the the spans between the two is called the conducting region or the conducting zone we're conducting a signal from receptive to secretory okay and that's typically where we're going to find the axon and if present, myelination. Conducting. Receptive. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right. Most, most of the neurons in your central nervous system are what's called interneurons. Most interneurons are multipolar. And we'll come back to that term very soon, interneurons, okay? But motor neurons are also multipolar. Oops, motor, motor. Okay, some few special sensory neurons, meaning serving the special senses. Our bipolar, which olfactory, olfactory, I, oh, and that, for that matter, ear. Sorry, I skipped that in the, in the previous mention. In fact, let's, let's slip the, that into your slide. Um, ear. Unipolar, unipolar neurons are uh, not not abundant in the central nervous system. They're mostly found in the, the peripheral nervous system, and they are likely to be. Oops, gosh, I get my brain out off of other topics. Sensory neurons. Okay, so most sensory neurons are unipolar. Few are bipolar, and then the rest of neurons are, are likely multipolar. The reality of what a multipolar neuron looks like is straight out of Dr. Seuss or Tim Burton's head. Aren't those crazy? And this one here is 
especially if I trace it. Do you kind of see a Christmas tree? A Christmas tree with horns or antlers? <laughs> or do you kind of see a triangle now that I traced one on there? Okay. Yeah, you kind of see a pyramid. Sure enough, these are called pyramidal cells. And this axon, by the way, goes on and on and on. And this axon, by the way, goes on and on and on. Okay? That's been cut. That's been cut. All right? Well, when pyramidal cells are clumped together, their clumped or clustered axons are referred to as pyramidal tracks. And we're going to run into that later. So I'm just... bringing it up now, mentioning it now, so that when you hear pyramidal tracks later in lecture, you think, oh, the Christmas tree ones. <laughs> okay. Bipolar cells, I think, end up looking uh, like anemones or hydra in reality, and unipolar cells. kind of look like deciduous trees. <laughs> okay. You've already hopefully picked up on the fact that we can also classify neurons based on what type of information they're relaying. Maybe they're relaying sensory information, which means that um, one end of that neuron or that chain of neurons uh, is linked to a sensory receptor and carrying that input to the central nervous system, okay? Whereas motor is carrying from central nervous system to effector, okay? Interneuron is any neuron that links the two, so any, any neuron in between. And mostly, we're gonna find interneurons in the central nervous system. The vast majority of your neurons are interneurons, okay? And if we look at the next slide, there's the rest of that huge table driving home for us. Oh, multipolar neurons are interneurons and motor neurons. Oh, Tessa already did that. Bipolar neurons are sensory neurons specific to some special senses. Okay, and other sensory neurons are more likely unipolar, okay? And that shorthand that I taught you is shown in these illustrations below, okay? Sensory from the receptor to the central nervous system. You can stay inside. Motor from the central nervous system to effector, okay? And this is such a shorty that the illustrator didn't bother to show this, sorry. This is such a shorty. The illustrator didn't bother to show any directionality, which makes sense, it's just too short, okay? That is 11A.